I'm Jancy to Spain with Bright Ideas Tutoring. This is part three of my series on the Clayson rearrangement. Finally, I'll cover the mechanism of this reaction. Hopefully now you know how to identify the reactants that can actually do this reaction, and you know a little bit of how to predict the style of product that's going to come from this reaction. But it's really, really important that you can actually do this mechanism in order to accurately predict product. So I'm going to take you through the steps of this mechanism, and then we'll practice doing it on some more difficult molecules. Um, we're going to do the mechanism on both the allele phenyl ethers and the allele vinyl ethers. So first let's start with just a really simple allele phenyl ether. The first thing you'll want to do is just think about what kind of product it's supposed to make. Allele phenyl ethers make a phenol, and then attached to carbon 2 of the phenol is an allele group. And then keep in mind that the more substituted this molecule is, the more substituted this molecule may be at this position, or here, or here. And then any substituents off the phenol may show up here off of the benzene ring. Okay, now we need to think about how we want to set this up to do the mechanism. And that's really the same way that we set it up to predict product. We want to put the allele group on top, bending over to the right. And we want to put the phenyl group down below. And we want to make sure that when we put our bonds in, we put in the first bond to the top right so that it can interact with this double bond. It's also really helpful to show this hydrogen because these two carbons are going to be interacting during the um, mechanism. And I like to show everything that's attached at those two carbons. Now, as far as the first step of the mechanism, I like to think about some reactions that we've done in the past. One of them is the reactions of benzene that we did um, with electrophilic aromatic substitution. We know that benzene is a great nucleophile. Benzene likes to send its carbon-carbon double bond pi electrons out to attack stuff. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. The first step of this reaction is that one of these double bonds is going to send its pi electrons out to do the attack. But what's it going to attack? And there I like to think about Diels Alder. And nobody likes to think about Diels Alder, right? I mean, it was a miserable reaction. But let's review it just for a second, okay? In Diels Alder, we had a conjugated diene. And we also had a double bond or a triple bond with an electron withdrawing group attached. And what would happen is that this diene would send its electrons out to attack. It would act as the nucleophile. And it would attack this bond, but it would specifically attack the carbon that was farthest away from the electron withdrawing group. And then the electrons would start getting pushed away. When I think about this reaction, it kind of reminds me of diels alder And if you remember diels alder or if you were good at it, that can help you here. So here's a carbon-carbon double bond. And can't we kind of pretend that this is an electron withdrawing group? So if this guy's going to come out and attack, it wants to attack the carbon furthest away from the electron withdrawing group. It's going to come out and attack this carbon right here and then the electrons are going to start getting pushed away. These electrons are going to move right there, so this bond is going to become single, and this bond is going to become double. And as a result, this bond is going to totally break, and then we're going to form a carbonyl right here. Now, this may seem kind of arbitrary and a little weird, right? But the good news is, if you draw your molecule the same way every time, with the allele group over to the right and the phenyl group underneath, then you can draw these arrows the same way every time. And it can almost become repetitive. Then at this point, all you have to do is report the news. You just predict your product according to the arrows that you drew. So here's our ring. Neither of these bonds have changed. Hydrogen's still here. But now this bond is no longer double because these electrons have gone out to bind to this carbon right here. 
And this bond is no longer double, it's single. But now we have a double bond here. And then this carbon is no longer bound to O. This is the end of the chain. And then looking at O, it is now double bond to carbon. Now, a lot of people want to stop the reaction here because it looks like it's done. <laughs> but there's a couple of things that can tell you you've got to keep going. One of them is knowing that the product of this reaction is supposed to look like this. Another thing is recognizing that we started with an aromatic compound and it has lost its aromaticity, and really that's not allowed. We have to finish with an aromatic compound. So we've got to figure out a way to restore aromaticity to our compound. We've got to get this double bond back. And the way to do that is kind of similar to the last step in electrophilic aromatic substitution uh, when we did reactions of benzene. We've got to remove the hydrogen from our sp3 carbon and we've got to use these electrons and dump them back into the ring in order to make benzene again. So what kind of nucleophile are we going to use to grab this hydrogen and dump these electrons back here? We actually use this oxygen. This oxygen is going to send its electrons out and it actually sends the electrons in the bond. And when it sends these out, it forms a bond between the O and the H. And then hydrogen's electrons go form a double bond right here. It's a two-step process. And our final product then has O bound to H, a double bond here, and our allele group on carbon two of phenol. Now, this step is really confusing to most students. And I want to talk to you about it for a second because I may be able to help. Let's look at this a different way. This is the way that I prefer to look at it and that makes more sense to me, okay? What if O grabbed hydrogen like this? then we'd actually see oxygen grabbing hydrogen and forming its single bond to hydrogen. Then we could see hydrogen dumping its electrons in to form a double bond. And then as a result, oxygen would push its electrons up to form a single bond. Does that make more sense to you? It does to me. So here we see O forming a single bond to H, H's electrons going down to form a double bond, and again O forming its single bond back up. We're just not allowed to show it that way. And really, this is kind of an extra step that's not needed. Why would O send its electrons up and then send them out to get H when it could just skip a step and send them directly to get H? That's what oxygen does. It just sends the electrons directly from the double bond to hydrogen. Instead of taking three steps, it just takes two. Do you think you're ready to try this mechanism for yourself? Okay, here's a much more complicated molecule. But we're going to take this one step at a time, and I'm going to lead you through it. So your first step is just to draw this in a more simple way. We want to see the allele group over and to the right and we want to see the phenyl group underneath with its bonds drawn in a way that they're ready to interact with the allele group. This is what my molecule looks like now. The first thing I did is just draw this basic allele structure, and then I went back and put in my substituents. I knew that once I had drawn this, I needed to put in my methyl group. And then I knew that this methyl was trans to the other one, which meant that my ethyl needed to be here. And then, of course, I didn't forget my methyl para to the oxygen. Now, your next step is for your carbon-carbon double bond electrons from the benzene ring to go out and attack this carbon of the allele group, and then for your electrons to push around. 
So let's just draw the electron pushing part and not necessarily draw the product of that. I showed the carbon-carbon double bond electrons of benzene attacking the far end carbon of my allele group. The carbon-carbon double bond crosses over and moves right here. And then this bond breaks and forms the carbon yield to my benzene ring. Now, how would you draw the results of this electron movement? This is a little bit scary, huh? Okay, this carbon is now bound right here. So we have a bond between these two. This carbon has a methyl, an ethyl, and now a single bond right here. This carbon has a methyl, and now we have a double bond between these two carbons. I don't mean for this to sound so ominous. It's actually thundering in my house while I'm recording this. All right, now this bond is broken. That's why there's no bond between here and the O. And this O is now double bonded to this carbon. And of course, we've lost our double bond here. So then our final step is to restore aromaticity. We need to show the two arrows, not three, that are gonna restore our OH and the double bond. So let's see if you can draw the two arrows that are gonna make that happen and then show our final product. Here are the arrows I drew. My double bond from my carbonyl went out to attack the H, and that led to an O to H bond. And then the electrons that bound my H went in to form the third double bond of my benzene ring. So my final product doesn't really look much different than this one, except that I now have a bond here and an OH group. And I do want to point out that this does have the characteristics that I'm looking for for my predicted product from an allele phenyl ether. I have phenol, and I have an allele group on carbon-2. Here you can see off carbon-2, I have a carbon-carbon double bond with an sp2, or excuse me, sp3 carbon in between. There just are other substituents going on as well. And those other substituents and the location of them is something that I really could not have predicted without doing the full mechanism. Now we need to look at how to predict products for allele vinyl ethers, which is a little bit different.